Hello and welcome to the training series offered by the City of Minneapolis. My name is Allison Bell and I'm the City's Green Infrastructure Coordinator. Our first training here will provide an introduction and overview to the updates to the City's stormwater ordinance with a focus on how this impacts our transportation projects. And then I'll introduce the Green Stormwater Infrastructure section of the Street Design Guide. My contact information will be at the end of the presentation and please feel free to reach out for any questions or follow up. This training is meant to get the audience familiar with both the stormwater ordinance and the GSI section of the street design guide. We will cover the changes to the stormwater ordinance and how transportation projects can meet these new requirements. And we'll also introduce the street design guide and walk through the GSI section so that this resource can be used when designing GSI on transportation projects throughout the city. So I'll start off with the updates to the chapter 54 stormwater ordinance. The big changes that we see on the ordinance are that we are eliminating the linear exemption that has historically been on projects in the city. So this means transportation projects will now have to evaluate whether or not they trigger the ordinance and are not immediately exempt. Another big change is that we've decreased the disturbance area required to trigger the ordinance. Where it was originally one acre, it is now down to a half an acre. Okay, so in terms of what triggers the ordinance, uh, the ordinance will go into effect in 2022. So if your project is in construction um, after January 1st of 2022, it is subject to the ordinance. Um, and if the project disturbs over a half an acre, it will trigger the ordinance. Um, if your project is both in 2022 and, and triggers the ordinance, uh, then we it will be subject to the three main requirements of the ordinance. Those are a volume control, a peak discharge rate control, and a water quality control. Um, what that kind of looks like in layman's terms is that we will need to infiltrate at least the treatment volume. And I'll explain how we calculate the treatment volume later. You need to meet or reduce this, the rate that stormwater leaves the site as compared to your existing conditions. And you need to remove a certain amount of pollutants from the stormwater leaving the site. So on a typical transportation project, we are likely going to meet the second requirement, the peak discharge rate control on a standard project. And the reason for that is that most of our projects um, in the city are reducing our impervious area. And so therefore we're, we're assuming that we're meeting that rate control requirement. So likely on your projects to demonstrate that you're meeting compliance with the second requirement, you'll just need to briefly explain the reduction in impervious area and why that results in um, a reduced peak discharge rate. Um, so that really only leaves the volume control and the water quality control. So we'll go into those as we move forward. Um, first, just to really define what triggers that one half acre of disturbance, you need to disturb the underlying soil. So, so not the road based material. So if you're doing a project that just is concrete rehab or mill and overlay, if you're not reaching the underlying soil beneath the road base, that does not count. Um, the area also needs to be connected. So if you have a roadway that's a series of um, intersections that are seeing improvement, um, if, if they're not connected and they're separated um, by the street, that, that will also not trigger the ordinance unless one of those areas results in a half acre of disturbance. Um, so with that, just to, again, in layman's terms, we're talking about about 22,000 square feet of disturbance. It looks like about half a city block or if you're installing half, um, one half of a mile of new trail or more, that's likely gonna trigger the ordinance. Okay, so now I'm going to provide some more information about those three requirement areas, the treatment volume, the water quality volume, and the rate control. For the treatment volume, it will be the greater of two calculations, 0.55 inches times the fully reconstructed impervious area, or 1.1 inches over new impervious area. For transportation projects, we fully expect uh, most to meet that 0.55 inches, um, just because it's not common that we're introducing new impervious area on our transportation projects. That calculation is more common for private development. But if there's some odd scenario um, where you're introducing more new impervious area, then you would have to meet the 1.1 inches over your new impervious area. Um, and our impervious areas are our roadway, sidewalk, trails, curb and gutter, um, and does not include our green spaces and our plantings. 
Um, so when you have a project that you know triggers the ordinance, this is one of the first steps is to calculate what that treatment volume is. And, and once you know what that volume is, that's what you have to sh have to infiltrate within your project area. For the water quality requirement, we'll need to demonstrate a removal efficiency for both total suspended solids and TP for a 1.25 inch rain event. That compliance should be shown in models such as MIDS or SLAM or similar models. Um, for total suspended solids across the city, it's 70%, and you'll need to refer to the Minneapolis Surface Water and Sewer Manual for the map that shows the TP removal requirements throughout the city, as it does vary based on the receiving water. For the rate control requirement, the project must meet or reduce the peak discharge rate for flow leaving the site at specified points, uh, which we define as the connection to a conveyance network that leads to an outfall. Typically, peak discharge rates increase when there is an increase in impervious area within the project. There are other potential factors, such as maybe an increase in slope or a significant change in the configuration of the drainage system where we route more flow to one system than we did in an existing design. Uh, but as I mentioned, we expect that a typical transportation project in the city will inherently meet the rate control requirements since they typically reduce the impervious area and we don't tend to drastically alter our drainage design. In most cases, we will just require a simple summary to explain that the peak discharge rate will be at or below the existing rate based on this assumption. Where we do not increase the impervious area uh, or where other factors contribute to a potential change in the peak discharge rate, a formal model will be required to demonstrate compliance uh, for a range of storm events. In order to help facilitate successful projects that uh, meet the new stormwater ordinance requirements and are designed uh, to our standards, we've set up some milestones and recommendations for what milestones and items to check off at, at each point in design. Um, we are formalizing this into a standard checklist that we would expect to be completed on all ordinance projects. Um, and so for now, I'll just give you an idea of what types of things we're expecting to be um, at each stage. Um, so first things first, uh, basically at 0%, we'll want to understand if the project triggers the ordinance or not, because that will follow a different series depending on what we determine there. So let's say we, we are a regulatory project, we need to meet the stormwater ordinance, then we should immediately understand what our requirements are, what our water quality requirements are, what our treatment volume is estimated to be. Um, understand our soil types and any major site constraints such as high groundwater, contaminated soils, or bedrock, um, and start identifying any further testing we need to do to understand our infiltration rates of our soils. Um, by layout, we should already start having GSI or other stormwater management devices used to meet the ordinance located on the plan, understanding their drainage area and how much impervious area is draining to each of those, um, and as I mentioned, we'll want to have a required and provided treatment volume for each GSI facility. Um, and we also want to start seeing things like the inlet details and cross sections of the um, stormwater management used to meet the ordinance. Um, additionally, we should have already started coordination with surface water and sewer to understand if there are any other issues like flooding or TMDLs that we need to consider in our designs, um, any asset management work that's going to be done. And really importantly, um, understanding our O&M feasibility, um, considering things like access and equipment and um, ability um, to maintain the proposed treatment. Um, and then we also want to start understanding if we have an opportunity to go above and beyond on a project. If the project's located somewhere where we have extra space or really highly infiltrating soils, we'll want to know that as soon as we can to understand if we can um, go much more beyond the requirements of the stormwater ordinance. Um, and we also want to start doing things like uh, community outreach to understand if there's any preferences or any um, issues with providing care, especially on places like a boulevard, where it will be the adjacent properties owners um, in their space and potentially part of their care responsibilities. Um, and by layout or 30%, we should start seeing a draft stormwater management report and these calculations that I've mentioned. And then by 60%, we should be taking kind of a, a finer point to the work that was done by 30%, um, we should have infiltration testing results so that we can have a design infiltration rate, start refining those calculations, um, have a water quality model set up to demonstrate that removal efficiency, 
uh, have an understanding of how the GSI facilities work in larger storm events. So above what the design storm was, do we have an overflow plan or can they handle larger events and start refining those details um, and cross sections. And then really 90% and 100 will, will be that same, um, you know, refining the point, making sure that we're taking into account any unexpected issues that have come up um, closer to construction like utilities or perhaps we found um, you know, bedrock or, or high groundwater or something like that, and that we're able to adjust to that and still meet the ordinance requirements. Okay, now I'll talk through some of the options to meet that treatment volume that we discussed. So the city prioritizes and prefers surface vegetated treatment, so things like bioretention and bioswales, just recognizing the co-benefits that come from incorporating green elements into our transportation projects. Um, we also except unit paving permeable surfaces to meet that treatment volume. Um, understanding that the space is limited at the surface, um, we also um, allow underground treatment and underground filtration and infiltration treatment to meet the requirements. If you've considered all of those and still cannot meet the requirements, um, we can consider routing to a regional or offsite BMP um, or perhaps incorporating off-site run on to the site and adding that into the treatment volume. Um, if those all don't work, we are establishing a banking system within the city where one project can um, pay to another project or to another initiative um, to basically overcompensate for the lack of meeting the requirements on one project. Um, that's still in the works um, and there'll be more training to come once that is more established. In addition to the banking system I just mentioned, we have a few more items in the work to help designers meet the stormwater ordinance and design green stormwater infrastructure to our standards. We plan to formalize the sequence of options to meet the requirements that I just went through um, to make it clear what steps we want to see and in what order to meet the requirements if we're in a situation where we can't meet them in the typical fashion on site uh, with green stormwater infrastructure. We're also working on a checklist that will outline what details and models should be included at each stage of design in order to meet the ordinance and follow best practices. And we're continuing to formalize standard details and specifications for green stormwater infrastructure facilities that incorporate lessons learned, uh, creating more standardized O&M plan requirements for different types of facilities, and any other guidance materials we find will help uh, along the way in this design process. So that was an overview of the stormwater ordinance and how to meet the requirements on transportation projects. Now I'm going to shift to cover one of the best tools we have to help designers meet these new ordinance requirements on transportation projects, and that's the GSI section of the Street Design Guide. So we have an abundance of training available for the entire Street Design Guide, so please reach out if you find that that would be useful. Uh, and for now, I'll just be introducing the GSI section of the guide. Um, so I just want to go over quickly, the, the GSI section in the Street Design Guide is there to you know, support successful design of GSI um, on our transportation projects. It's also to capitalize on the other initiatives that are around greening spaces in, in the city and to align those goals so we can maximize them. Um, and then it's to make sure that we're designing with Minneapolis's standards and best practices. So really quickly, um, you'll notice in the street design guide that we have a greening section um, and that defines two components of greening. Um, one is sustainable landscaping, and that's going to be things like increasing impervious area, incorporating trees and native plantings, boulevard restoration, um, and the other is green stormwater infrastructure or GSI. So that's going to be what you're more familiar with in, when you hear about green infrastructure, bioretention, permeable pavement, tree trenches. Um, and for the street design guide, um, that's going to be what we're going to focus on, just the GSI section. So in the GSI section, there's um, the rules that need to be followed. So the city ordinance, any watershed district rules, any state regulations that might be triggered on your project. There's best practices and links to um, helpful design guides like NACTO or the Minnesota Stormwater Manual. And then uh, much more information about how to design um, and meet both GSI best practices and city standards. Um, so as I mentioned, we have just quick access to, um, to all of the requirements that are likely relevant from a stormwater perspective on your transportation project, just so that those are easier to access. 
Um, and again, quick links to um, our very common manuals and design guidance. Uh, we've also included a table um, of all of the criteria that needs to be included in your design. Um, so recommendations for the contributing drainage area to each facility, um, any significant uh, hydrologic parameters. Um, so you know, depending on your soil type, what's the infiltration rate you should use, what runoff coefficient for your drainage area, um, and, and all the modeling software that, that the city accepts, um, design rainfall, and really important site suitability information. Uh, there's also a helpful section on uh, recommendations and uh, adjustments to be made, depending on um, any site suitability issues, um, including space constraints or soil amendments, um, and when to consider using those. Um, and to make things simple, we defined three main GSI types, a bioswale, which would be um, bioretention with vegetated sloped sides, a planter, which is bioretention with um, vertical hard edges, like the, the um, planters we see in the middle, and then permeable pavement. Um, for each of those um, GSI types, we've provided guidance for each specific design element within the GSI. So the footprints of the GSI, the recommendations around curb cuts, um, infiltration rates, um, plant selection and soils and soil amendments. Um, each also has a graphic. Um, this is to help planners visualize GSI within their projects, um, what space it takes up, uh, what required, what the required setbacks look like in their project space, um, and also demonstrates any design modifications like um, an under drain or amended soils. On this example, we see the, the um, vegetated side sloped bioretention. Um, another important section of the GSI section shows the documentation and it shows what items need to be completed at which design phase. Um, so again, this is something that we're going to formalize into a checklist for stormwater ordinance projects, but for any GSI facility um, on a transportation project in the city, this will help you understand what should be done at each phase of design. Um, we're continuing to make updates in the GSI section. Um, we're going to update the graphics um, and include more specific uh, installations like at bump outs or protected bike lanes that we can expect to see throughout the city um, and incorporate some lessons learned and include some more direct information about how to comply with the new stormwater ordinance. Thank you so much for joining the uh, City of Minneapolis training series. Um, my contact information is on the screen there. Please feel free to reach out for any questions or any further discussion. I uh, look forward to hearing from you and look forward to the future training sessions.